If you notice, pre, or while we're in the pandemic, this has all become a big thing. Take your mask off, turn the mic on, all that good stuff. But now is the, now is the time in our service where we take a look at an ancient piece of literature and try to figure out what it means. Did you guys ever think about it this way? This is over 3,000 pushing 4,000 year old piece of literature. You ever just say to yourself, why do we do this? Um, why do we look at something so old and times have really changed? But the reason that we look at this, we are Scranton Road Bible Church, right? We believe that this book and the 66 books inside it are the Word of God. These are God's very own words to us. And even though it's pushing 4,000 years old, times have changed. But what I want you guys to understand is our God has not changed. So we don't look at this word and say, I wonder how God would handle this today because he is all right just a couple of passages that I want to bring to your attention every good and perfect gift is from above coming down from the father of the heavenly lights who does not change like shifting shadows right and then there's another that's in James and one in Hebrews says Jesus Christ is the same yesterday today and forever so God hasn't developed, he hasn't grown, he hasn't improved, he hasn't gotten worse. He is. He is. And that's his name. Did you know that? Hebrew for he is is Yahweh. Did you guys know that you were all saying that today while we were singing? When you say Alleluia, did you know that? We let, it means let us praise Yahweh or let us praise he is. Because he doesn't change. So I just, I felt led to say this before I preach this morning. Just let's not forget what this is. This is a living word of our living God that is not changeable. So when we apply it to our lives, we know that God is the same 4,000 years ago as he is today. And 50,000 years in the future when we'll, when we'll be with him forever, right? Isn't that awesome? So while we get into this word together... Let me have a word of prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you do not change. You are the same. You are. And we thank you that you are so amazing to us. And I pray now that as we take a look at your word today, this passage in Exodus, it's a, a really cool passage, Father. I pray that you would be the one speaking and you would be the one teaching through me by your spirit and that it would not fall on ears that are not listening, but I pray that you would all help us, myself included, to hear your word, to be changed by your word, and to follow your word. Help us not to be merely listeners of the word, but doers of the word as well. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Well, I think one thing during this pandemic that Americans, including myself, and probably you, are getting better acquainted with is your TV set. Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. And so I think since we have nothing to do as much as we used to, we're getting more acquainted with the good old TV. And is it just me or are writers of like TV and movies kind of running out of things to write about? Has anybody noticed that? So now we're starting to see all these things coming up again. So we're seeing reunion shows and like of our favorite shows when we were growing up what are the what is it like when they were there or like they're gonna retake the same story and make a new show of it again and uh we just see this over and over again and one of those that i've been thinking about this week is um and i haven't watched it yet so i don't know if it's good or not this is not an endorsement i don't know so it is called cobra kai has anybody ever heard of that cobra kai it's about um it uh, comes from a movie back in the 80s, back in the, back in the good old days, if you will, a movie called The Karate Kid. Has anybody ever seen that show before? But this is like Daniel and the guy that he fought at the end. Remember when he did the crane kick? I would do that, but I'd probably fall down. You guys probably wouldn't want to see that. So 
um, it's them now, today. So I don't know what happens it or anything. But I always liked the Karate Kid, the movie. And do you guys remember that? It's just a story of a skinny young guy that moves to a new place and he gets picked on. He gets bullied. And all of a sudden, one day, he finds all of these guys jump him and start beating him, right? And out of nowhere comes this little guy, this little old guy, really, and just, you guys remember this? He, like, cleans all their clocks, and they go running away, whimpering and crying. All these young men get beat up by a little old man. And this guy named Daniel is like, what? How did that, how did that happen? Can you teach me how to fight like that? He said, sure. And then he came back, and, like, Day after day later, he said, all right, first thing you got to do is sand the floor. You guys remember that? And then you got to paint my fence. And then you got to wax my car. And he does that all day. And then the next day he comes back, you got to paint my house. And finally, Daniel is like, I can't, yeah, whack, you guys remember that? Wax on, wax off. I came here for you to teach me how to fight karate. But you're just making me my slave. Why are you doing this? And he said, I am teaching you karate. He said, no, not. I've just been doing all this work, all this work. And then finally he said, wax on, wax off. And then Mr. Mr. Miyagi was the old guy. He was like, he actually went to hit him. Ah! Wax on. And Daniel blocked the punch. Uh, And then what was it? Sand the floor. And then he kicked him. And Daniel kicked the floor and blocked his kick. So it was like all those things that he had been doing, he didn't even realize it. But they were, they were training him to fight. They were training him karate. And it kind of all kind of came on. The light, pipe, the light popped on for Daniel. He was like, oh, you've been getting ready, me ready to uh, fight, to have karate, to know karate, have karate. You can tell I'm not a karate kid myself. So, all right. But wouldn't it, wouldn't it be nice to know that that your life, what you've been doing all these years, may really be for a reason? Wouldn't that be kind of nice? Sometimes don't you think, like, I'm such and such years old, and you put your age in there, like, what have I been doing with my life all of these years? What have I been doing? Wouldn't it be nice to know if somebody was behind the scenes in total control and using everything that you have gone through to prepare you something, and you didn't even realize it? Well, here, this is what I want to come to tell you today. Like I said, God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. One of the things that has not changed, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it, is our God is in complete control of every situation. Sometimes, is that... Do you admit that sometimes that's really hard to believe? I think so. But he is behind the scenes getting what I believe in this passage. We can see this. He's behind the scenes in a man named Moses, one of the greatest leaders in the Bible, one of my heroes personally. He is behind the scenes preparing him to lead. Now what I want to talk about today is Is God still in that business today? And I really believe, yes. All the things in your life, do you think he's getting you ready for something? To do great things for him? I hope you believe that. And I'm going to take a drink here. My throat's getting dry. But sometimes we might say, well, I totally messed up. I made mistake after mistake after mistake surely that means that God really can't use me anymore well the good news in this passage is we're going to see somebody that made a really really big mistake and God in his and the word the big word of sovereignty that he's in control of all things he used somebody that made a big mistake that had big consequences that came with that mistake. God used him and used what he went through to do great things for him. And I believe God can do that today. So I want to I leave a couple of things that you really chew on and think about. 
believe that God is still working in the lives of his people. Do you believe that? He's still working in the lives of his people. And number two, trust that he is in control, full of grace. And I looked at grace while I said that. Full of grace and that he keeps his promises. This passage is about Moses and what he went through. But ultimately, this is about the faithfulness, the grace, and the power of our God. All right? So you guys want to dig into it with me? Let's take a look at it, all right? This is uh, Exodus chapter 2, starting in verse 11. And thank you, Rita, for reading that for us. So it says, One day after Moses had grown up, he went out to where his own people were and watched them at their hard labor. So if you guys remember about Moses, is he had, Pastor Joe talked about it last week, that he had this amazing birth where his mom was kind of like Noah in the ark, had Moses in the little ark, and came up, and who would have found him but the daughter of the man that wanted him killed? But what happened? She had compassion, and she says, I'm going to raise him as my own. And then he got taken care of by his mom for a number of years. And then he grew up in the king of Egypt's household. And you know, you guys probably all knew that, but the word Pharaoh is the word for king in Egypt. So he got to be raised basically as a prince. So when you get raised as a prince, is your life pretty easy or is your life pretty hard? I guess it depends on how you look at it. But yeah, you can have big expectations and stuff, but you're going to get the best education. You're going to never be in want. You're going to be taken care of. All your needs are going to be met. So it's going to be good. Somewhere along the line, Moses was finding out about his actual ethnic background and that he was the Jews. And he's finding out over time that his people don't have it as nice as he does, right? They're slaves. They're made to work really, really, really hard to do things that are very difficult. And they're just, they're suffering while he's got it good and he's got it made. And so we get a little glimpse of this in the New Testament. If you look at um, Acts chapter 7, Stephen's speech, he kind of talks about, he gives us some context to this story, which is kind of nice. But it says this happened about when Moses was 40 years old. So I don't know what was going on, but he probably was saying, these are my people. I kind of want to go see for myself what's going on with them. So he went out and he probably saw, because he probably didn't see this firsthand. He was growing up in the palace and has probably kept sheltered away from this, is my guess. A lot of this is speculation, right? But he saw how hard that they were being worked. And look what he, he did see, too. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and look what it says here, one of his own people. So an Egyptian slave master was starting to beat a Hebrew man. And look at what Moses did. All right, look at verse 12. Glancing this way and that, and seeing no one, he killed the Egyptian and hit him in the sand. We don't know if this happened immediately or afterward. But I want you to see what happens here. So the guy was getting beat. And I don't know if he waited and followed him afterwards or if he did it right away. But let's just think about what happens here legally. Okay, I get to work in the law field for my regular job. And think about this legally, what's happening here. If he was just going in to protect the guy and got in the way and kind of to break things up and went a little too far and had to defend himself and maybe kill the Egyptian, that would probably be manslaughter, right? That would probably be understood as manslaughter. If he got really, really mad and rushed in and killed the guy, that would have been murder, right? But he thought about it. He looked around. Nobody's there. And he killed the guy Oh, and he buried him in the sand. This is first degree murder. This is premeditated murder and disposing of a body, right? This is major wrong stuff. And I think, I don't know, 
I think his intentions were good. His intentions were of a thing to say, okay, I want to protect my people. I'm seeing how bad it is, and I'm going to protect my people. But the problem is he took things into his own hand, went outside of what God wanted him to do, and went and killed somebody. And to even use the term in broad daylight, not necessarily. He did it on the sly, right? He was sneaky about it, and then he buried and got rid of the evidence. So this is major premeditated murder, and Moses is like, all right, I'm doing my part to help my people, but it was definitely something that was wrong. All right? So let's look at what happens. The next day, he went out and saw two Hebrews fighting. He asked the one in the wrong, why are you hitting your fellow Hebrew? So it kind of reminds me, have you got any basketball players out here? When you go to try to get, you ever do that, try to go up and get a rebound, and it's your own teammates getting the rebound. You're like, oh, same team, same team. And then you know, it's like you don't want to fight with your own teammates. Moses is going out. I see Egyptians beating you. Why are you beating each other up? What is, what's going on here? We need to be united in our stance here. And so the guy was like, yeah, you're right. Let's rise up and, and set ourselves free, right? Because everybody loves to be corrected and told when they're doing things wrong, right? No. The man said, have you ever heard this one before? I've heard it from children sometimes. I've heard it from adults too. So the man said, who made you ruler and judge over us? Are you thinking of killing me as you killed the Egyptian? So the guy, his temper was probably still going. I don't know if anybody has a temper here, but I know I do. So his temper was still going, and he's probably like, what are you trying to tell me? And I'm sure what's going on in the back of his head here is, okay, you've been in the lap of luxury for 40 years, and now you're going to come out and be, okay, you're going to take care of us now. Why should I listen to you? It's like, what are you talking about? Get out of here. And so that's basically what happened. But then Moses realized my, my murder that I committed that I thought I got away with, everybody knows about it because it had gotten around by that time. So as it said, Then Moses was afraid and thought, what I did must have become known. So we're going to see here, Moses went, did something semi-impulsively, but he did something wrong, even though it was good intentions underneath it. And now he's going to have to live with the consequences of what he's done. So verse 15, when Pharaoh heard of this, he tried to kill Moses. But Moses fled from Pharaoh and went to live in Midian, where he sat down by a well. So he went hundreds of miles away. He is now a man on the run. He's a fugitive of justice. Pharaoh is ready to execute him. You can imagine Pharaoh, right? So, okay, I let you in my house. I gave you the best education, the best of all things. And the first thing that you do is go out and kill one of my Egyptian people and basically turn your back on me. It's time. And if you know anything about kings in the ancient world, they could kill people at the drop of a hat. So that's what was going on with, with Moses. So he knew the only way that I'm going to get out of this is if I run. And so he became a fugitive, and he went hundreds of miles away, somewhere in the vicinity of the Sinai Peninsula, in, um, which would be present-day Egypt, I think, or somewhere near that area in the Arabian Peninsula, which would be present-day Saudi Arabia. So somewhere in that area. And he sat down at a certain well. And what happened then? Moses was still, you know, part of his education is he learned how to handle himself. And he learned how to fight, right? And part of that was why he could kill that Egyptian. But what happens is another time, and I forgot to tell you what I was going to call this too. But instead of four weddings and a funeral, we're going to call this four beatings and a wedding. Because that's kind of what happens. We got beating number one, the Egyptian. Beating number two. Pharaoh, or um, the two Hebrews, do I got that right? No. Beating number one, the Egyptian, no beating number two, Moses with the Egyptian. Beating number three, the two Hebrews. Now we're going to get into beating number four, all right? And what it is, says here is, now a priest of Midian had seven daughters, and they came to draw water and fill the troughs to water their father's flocks. So seven women that were kind of like the the damsels in distress, right? 
And it says, some shepherds came along and drove them away. It's like, you're not getting water now. We're getting water now. Get out of here. It's not your turn. And they drove those seven daughters away with all their flocks. But Moses got up and came to their rescue and watered their flock. So he came, same good intention kind of people, fight for the underdog. We don't know what kind of fight it was or if he was just, he was probably like a big ripped Egyptian looking soldier that could handle himself. And I don't know if he needed to do anything, but those guys were like, okay, we'll do what you say. All right. And they got out and, and then Moses went and got all the water, which is a lot of work. And he watered their flock. So then it says, when the girls returned to Ruel, their father, he asked them, why have you came back so early today? He was like, how did you get your work done so much? And they answered, an Egyptian rescued us from the shepherds. He even drew water for us and watered the flock. And where is he, asked the daughters. Why did, or he asked the daughters, why did you leave him? Invite him to have something to eat. So the dad was like, who helped you out? And why didn't you say thank you or do anything? We need to have a thank you dinner for him. And so Moses agreed to stay with them. Things led to another that he kind of got accepted and that family opened, them, opened their arms to him. And what's even better is he gave his daughter Zipporah to Moses in marriage. He even got a stronger bond with this family that he got married into it. And then Zipporah gave birth to a son, so Moses becomes a dad. And Moses names him Gershom, saying, I have become an alien in a foreign land. So that's where we end up with Moses today. As he says, I am an alien in a foreign land. He got a great upbringing in the, in the Egyptians. He decided to go out and see his people, acts impulsively, kill someone and he becomes a fugitive on the run and when he has his first child he realizes it he's away from the people and the nation that raised him Egypt he has to be away from his own people the Hebrews he is by himself and he even feels so strongly about it as he names his firstborn Gershom he says I become an alien in a foreign land so here's Moses a murderer, a fugitive, apart from the people that raised him, apart from his own people, he's all on his own. He's probably sitting there thinking, what in the world is my life? What a waste. What am I going to do now? But what's amazing is chapter 3, we're going to see God step into this and call Moses and say, I want you to do X, Y, and Z, and we'll talk about that next week. And then Moses steps up and leads and becomes a great leader of people. But what I want to talk about today is, have you ever felt like you've been in that place? Have you ever felt and looked back at your life and say, you know, we've all had, we've all had expectations for our life, right? And we all dream when we're kids, this is going to happen, this is going to happen, but Years down the road, we say, this isn't, what I, this isn't what I had pictured. What am I doing here? Have I wasted all of those years? And my answer for you today from God's word is, it's really not about you. It's about God. And God is two things. He's sovereign and he's full of grace. Okay? Okay. So the first thing, sovereignty of God, is he's in control of every situation. And I hope you believe that. And he is in control of every situation. And every one of yours, your life, anybody that's watching on camera or in the gym, God is in control of your life. But he's also full of grace. So that word grace, we use that word a lot. And I'm not sure oftentimes we understand what that word means. But grace means it's a gift you're given that you don't even begin to deserve it, right? And I want you to see here that God is full of grace. He gives us things that we don't at all deserve. And he gives Moses things here that he does not deserve. First thing is I want to talk about, he's a sovereign, he's in control of where we were born 
and where and how we grew up. All right? I want you to know that. Do you ever wonder, why was I born here? Why did I have this family? And some of you might be coming from, like, a, it does, you know, it's all different kinds of things. You may have come from a wealthy family, but there wasn't a lot of love in it. You might have come from a poor family, and there was a lot of love in it. You might have come from, I don't know what your situation is. You might have come from the most horrible background known to man. You ever wonder, why did that happen to me? Well, God is in control over where we were born and over how and where that we grew up. He has it for a reason. Think about wax on, wax off. He's getting us ready for something that we don't even realize. And there's a passage of scripture that talks about this in Acts chapter 17. This is uh, Paul speaking in Athens, and he's speaking to people in Athens, Greece. And it says, From one man he made every nation of men that they should inhabit the whole earth. So who did God make which nation? All of them that cover the entire earth. And then this is really important, and I want you to look at this. This is Acts 17, 26, and 27. And he determined the times set for them and the exact places where they should live. God does this so that men would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. So the place you were born, the people that you grew up with, just like Moses, God determined that. And he brought you up in that, re- that environment for a reason. It's like, just think, wax on, wax off. He's preparing you for a certain mission. And I, and I just think of Moses. Like, he, bought, he got the best education in the world at that time. And what I believe is that, you know who the author of the first five books of the Bible is? Moses. Where did he get the education to write those books of the Bible. There you go. It's for a purpose, right? Everything's done for a purpose. And then, it's the same with you. You may have gotten the best education that money offered, or you may have been a dropout, but you got a good education in the school of hard knocks, or you got an education from the streets. Guess who was sovereign over that? God. Why did he want to train you the way that he wanted to train you? And that's why I hate it when people are like, in our culture, oh, I got such and such letters after my name. Well, God puts us through all different forms of education to raise us up to be the people that he wants us to be. Do you believe that? Anybody look at where you grew up and where you're born and like, man, I got a raw deal. I want you to take a look at that from a different way and say, Maybe God did that for a reason. Maybe God did that for a reason. If you're born wherever you were or whatever happened to you. But then guess what happens, everybody? And this is everybody in this room. Just like Moses, we take things into our own hands and we make big mistakes. And we got to live with the consequences of our mistakes, right? Moses became a fugitive. How many of you would say that? I had this opportunity and I totally messed it up. I did what was wrong. Here's what I want to tell you today. God is in control of our mistakes. All right? He is sovereign over even the consequences of our mistakes. He knew it was going to happen. It happened. We got there. And he's in control of that. Look at what Moses made a horrible mistake. And he went on the run and God connected him with a great family He got a great wife out of it. He started to have children out of it. God is in control of our mistakes and the consequences of our mistakes. And we can mess up and mess up and mess up. And God can still say, I can still use you. It takes a little bit on our part to say, all right, I want to do what you want me to do. Use me however you want to use me. All the way back, all the way through our lives, just this, like this part of Moses, he gives grace again and again and again. Moses got away. God gave him grace there. Moses finds 
this family. God gave him grace there. God gave him a wife, Zipporah. He gave him grace there. Things that You see, these are things that he don't deserve. God gave him a, a son. These are things that he doesn't deserve. And what I want you to look at now is take a look at your life and all the things that have happened. Can you see God's grace year after year after year? The things that he's given you that don't deserve. Just tell him thank you. Isn't that amazing? And the point of what I want to try to make today is, what, why are you here? God is in control of what's happened in your life. He wants to use you just like he used Moses. And it's just up to us to say, God, what is it that you would have for me? And then to submit to him and say, I want to follow you. Use me. So if you're sitting there today thinking, why did I go through all this? God knows. Ask him, what are you getting me ready for? What do you want to use me for? And then if you're thinking, I just am not worthy anymore, listen really closely, okay? I'm not worthy to serve God. You're right. You're not worthy to serve God. But he made you worthy by Jesus' death on the cross for you. He paid the price for your sins. And he says, I want not just to be your master, I want to be your father. And I want to use you for great things. So give your heart to him and say, all those things, I've done this, yes. And Jesus will say, I forgive you. Now let me use you. So what has God brought you to this point in 2021 for? Will you let him use you? Speaking of 2021, does anybody notice it's kind of been a, well, 2020 especially, it's been kind of hard. Anybody notice that lately? And I think the rest of this passage talks about this, but do you ever start to think like, man, has God forgotten about us? Has anybody thought that? You don't have to raise your hand. But has, have you thought that? Like, God is, has God forgotten about me? Like, he seems so far away. And I want to get to this last part of the passage. And I want to tell you that this passage has so much meaning in my life that I named one of my kids after it. Did you know that? So I want you to really pay special attention, okay? So in verses 23 to 25, and this is how amazing our God is. Okay, it says, during that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help, um, because of their slavery, went up to God. So they were struggling, they were hurting, and they were groaning. You know what that is? You ever worked really hard, and you're groaning, and you're just frustrated, and you're stressed? It's like, I am done and they cried out. They did the best thing that they could do. They cried out to God for help. And now let's look at what our God, or who our God is. Same today, right? It's the exact same. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and was concerned about them. I want you to see all of those words there. God heard. He still hears our prayers today. He still hears our desperate cries for help today. And he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. This is so, this, his passage has touched me so much. Does anybody know my middle son's name? Anybody know? My, no, my middle son. Zach. So Zach Ariah. The, the Hebrew word for Zach, or for Remember is Zach, all right? And Zachariah, Yah, does anybody know what that means? Yah, right? Yahweh, he is. He is remembered. He is remembered. And this is so important to me because God has promised us so much. I wanted to remind us that he remembers those promises. And this isn't because God forgot. I want you to understand this. Sometimes we remember because we forget. God doesn't change. He doesn't forget. He doesn't lose knowledge. He doesn't need to be reminded. But he just remembered. He knew what he promised. And how do I know he didn't forget? Back in Genesis, 
15, the promise to Abraham. This was the promise to Abraham. This was years before. Know for certain that you're, about 400 actually. Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a country, not their own, and they will be enslaved and mistreated 400 years. God knows all about it. Promise. But I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You see those promises? God remembered that promise. How many of you have had people break their promises on you? Do you trust that God will keep his promises? He will, okay? God is a God who keeps his promises. And if you think sometimes, he's forgotten about me. No, he hasn't. And Peter talks about this a little bit. He said that in the last days, there's going to be people that say, where is this coming that he promised? Like saying, you think God's coming back for you? He's not coming back. Where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Um, but Peter writes this, but do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not waiting, wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. It's a fact. He's going to keep his promise. The problem is we don't know when. And the people of Israel didn't know when. Well, they could have looked. And God promised to Abraham 400 years. Actually, they didn't have this text with them. So... They didn't know. They were crying out, God, when are you going to come through with your promises? He is. He is going to keep his promises. So just remember this. God remembers and keeps his promises. Isn't God good? Isn't that awesome? But I want you to know, God is in control of our lives. He's in control of your life. My question for you is, Will you offer your life to be used by him for his purpose? That's up to you. Will you offer your life to be used for his purpose? And he can do great things through you. Say, I want to give you my life. And if you're out there, God is in control. So do we say, okay, God, I'm going to do this, this, and this. Well, he's in control. He got you ready for a specific thing. So we need to approach him and say, what have you made me for? What is it that I want to do for you? Or what is it that you want me to do for you? I want to be your servant. I want to serve you. And kids, especially, if you're watching, I see some of you out there, and I'm sure some of you are listening too. Don't think, oh, Moses got away with murder. But look at the consequences that he had to go through. If you would learn today to say, not, what do I want to be when I grow up? But to say, Jesus, what did you make me for? And help me to follow you even today. You're going to save yourself from a lot of heartache. And ask anybody in this room that's older than you. Learn to trust Jesus now and say, you're in control. What is it that you want me to do with my life? So God is in control. I want to encourage you. He keeps his promises. He gives us things that we don't deserve. He gives us jobs and abilities that we don't deserve. And he's brought you to this point for a reason. Will you follow him? Will you let him use you? Let's pray. Father, we thank you, thank you, thank you for how good you are to us. You are so amazing, you are so kind, and you're so big and powerful that we don't deserve a second of your time, but you love us and you came for us. You offered your life as a sacrifice for us so that we could live with you forever and be used by you forever to do great things for your kingdom with an eternal impact. Help us to see, look back on our lives and see your hand in it over and over and over again, that you're getting us ready for something. Give us wisdom to know what it is that you're leading us to. Give us the courage to follow you and to be used by you. 
We love you and we thank you that you always keep our promises and that you are coming back for us one day. You're coming back for us. Help us to rest in that today. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. So you should have received when you came in a little cup with uh, the Lord's Supper, the elements of the Lord's Supper in it, the bread and the cup. I would ask you to take that out right now. And if you have not received one of those, either in the gym or here, just raise your hand and we'll make sure you get one. So I see somebody that doesn't have any. But does anybody, does anybody think that they're forgetful? Anybody forget things? All right. That's a big reason why Jesus gave us this bread and the cup. It's because he knows how forgetful that we are. All right? What does he say? Do this in remembrance of me. Let this never get old, what Jesus has done for us. And I want to invite you to open the part with the bread and just take that out for a second. And let's think about this. We talked about, I forgot to mention at the beginning, but we talked about four beatings in a wedding, right? Think about the beating. This represents the body of Christ, right? Thinking about what Jesus went through in his physical body for us. He was whipped, he was punched, he was beaten with rods, he was nailed to a cross, and after he was dead, he died of suffocation, right? After he died, they pierced his side with a, uh, with a spear. Why did he do that? I want you guys to look at me right now. He did that because he loves you, and he wants to be in your life forever. Look at this. We've all sinned and we deserve punishment, right? See behind me, the wages of sin is death. Our sin makes us, our punishment is death. But look over there. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. His punishment in the body, he took, he, the punishment that was meant for us, he took for us. So remember that, that there was true pain, there was true suffering for you and for me. So as you take the cup or the bread, think about the body of Jesus broken for you. And at that last, same last meal, Jesus passed around a cup and he did something very strange and he said, here's some Here's some grape drink, some, some wine in that case, but we've got grape juice. And he said, this is my blood that was shed for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The book of Hebrews talks about that. It says, without shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. In the blood of Jesus, he is the creator God that came to, man, to earth as a man. And when he shed his blood, it needed to be shed once. And all our sins are forgiven, past, present, and future sins by the power of this blood. We sang about it this week, or last week, right? Remember the, about the blood that never loses its power. It still can forgive, it's still, we can still be forgiven with this blood. But he shed it for us. And do this in remembrance of Jesus and his blood of the new covenant. Pray with me. Jesus, I am so forgetful. I forget what happened a couple weeks ago, really. I pray that you will not let me or any of my friends and my brothers and sisters here to forget the death that you died in our place, the blood that you shed for the forgiveness of our sins, for the new covenant that we can be called your children. Help us not to forget. And I think as we have the taste of the bread in our mouth right now, and as we taste that grape juice in our mouth, that we would be thinking about 
your sacrifice for us and that we would sacrifice our lives for you and say, I know you've made me who I am and you've allowed me to go through what I've gone through. Will you please use me in any way you want? So Father, help us to follow you and to love you. Thank you for your love and your grace, giving us this death that we definitely did not deserve. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.